Well, good morning, brethren. Good morning. It's good to be here again. Just thinking a while ago, when was the last time I was here? Can't remember. <laughs> I think it's been a while, maybe 10 years. But yeah, it's been 10 years. You know the years just keep going by? Yeah, but it's good to be here. See quite a few familiar faces. And um, it's good to see that you're still hanging on. As Larry pointed out, we're, my wife Bev and I, we're, we become snowbirds, if you know that terminology. <laughs> we're trying to escape that cold north. You know, last night we were just talking to our daughter back home and she said, Daddy, the snow is up to my car. I said, I wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a big um, relief for us. You know, I've been in Canada for a while and you know, that time comes, I'm not retired, so I have a little more time. My wife will retire later this year as well. So I won't be away that long again, I can tell you. We'll be here annually during the winter months, and um, between here and Clearwater, you'll see, you'll see more of us. But brethren, we're here to, to talk, to reason, if we want to use that term. And the title I'm using today for the sermon is, are you in the ark? I was just on our, on our way here. We had our radio on a station that was talking about God. And it was a question and answer and people were calling up asking questions. Of course, the crisis in Ukraine was topical and people were wondering what effect, if any, it will have on Bible prophecy. And you know, usually there are the pundits talking about Magog and Rush, Russia and, and so on and you know. But he, he said one thing which I agreed with and that was the fact that not every time you hear a war breaks out, it means Christ is coming. Because that was a line of reasoning and questioning from people. Oh, is the rapture um, about to happen? And blah, 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 you know. But I think, though, that when we have situations like this, I think it, it should bring us more awareness. And we just heard that um, mention a while ago of being temporary, how temporary we are but being more aware of the times that we live in. And for all of us to be prepared for the return of the king. Times are not going to get better. I remember earlier this year I, I did a sermon, I, I, I thought of giving it here today, that we should hope for the best, but prepare for the worst because we are heading into uncharted waters. We've seen an experience, a pandemic, and still in it. Now we are hearing of wars, we are hearing of troubles on the economic front, economic dislocations, families losing jobs, a lot of insecurity out there. But I come here today to ask and to remind all of, all of us. So I'm asking the question, are we on the ark? We know the ark is a refuge. When you're on a ship, you feel like you're at home. Those of us who haven't been on a ship, I'm telling you this, you feel like you're at home. We were, my family and I, we were a bit tardy some years ago to even go on a ship. You know, there's that notion that you're on the water and the ship is going to sink, and how can this big bill, um, you know, structure on the water that weighs so much ton, how it doesn't sink? <laughs> so what we did, er, what we did um, a few years ago, we took a short trip to the Bahamas, a short boat trip, just to experience what it was. And I tell you, it, it, it was like home. And from there, of course, we went on the bigger cruises, which 
bigger and those ships are really steady. It's like a floating hotel. You're like in here, you don't, you don't even realize you're on a ship. So a ship is seen as a kind of, uh, in this context I'm speaking, it's a kind of refuge. The marine life is bounteous. You're on the open seas and you know below there's a lot of life going on there. Big fish eating small fish and you know to survive and you know all kind of different creatures down there crawling around and, and so on. Lots of bounteous life. And, you know, scientists estimate that there are about, uh, about one million species of animals or, and mammals that live in the ocean. Yeah. But, of course, most of them are invertebrate. We don't even, can't even see them. I mean, they're so far down. You, know, you couldn't just swim down there. The water pressure would just blow your brains. So life is booming beneath and above. You're in this refuge. So for the Christian, Noah's Ark provides an interesting comparison to what's going on around our society today because we hear of death and destruction and our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine. You can imagine the families, the grief of young babies or, or, and, and elder seniors and middle age and people who are not sick and people who are sick. Life being just flushed out. And when it's not life, it's destruction. Homes destroyed, workplaces just bombed. And I just heard there's nearly 700,000 refugees already in Poland and another million perhaps seeking some place of refuge. So you see that all of that happening and you look into yourself as a child of God and you realize that and you say to yourself, thank you, Yahweh, I've answered your call. But that's not the end. We have to be overcomers so that we can be counted worthy to sit with him in his throne, on his throne as he overcome the world and now sitting with the Father in his throne. So there's a lot happening outside of the ark, as we can see now. Dr. John Whittacombe and Dr. Henry Morris in their book, The Genesis Flood, they did an exceptionally thorough job of analyzing pertinent data relating to the physical dimensions of Noah's Ark. For example, they say it would have a total cubic volume of 1.5 billion cubic feet, and that would equal the capacity of 569 modern railroad tracks or stock cars. We know it took Noah and his family a lot of years, at about 120 years to build it. We know too that Noah preached to people, but no one listened. But as huge as the ark was, yes, we just had a handful of people in it. Our populace of nearly 8 billion people, maybe a little over, we have a little over a million Catholics and we have evangelicals and we have other smaller movements, billion rather. And so we find a handful, not to mention the Church of God, who somehow are riding the tides, the high tides, and remaining afloat in this troubled society of ours. But the big question is, why did Noah why did Noah and his family escape the wrath of this deluge which covered the entire earth in a flood? Why? They hearkened to the word of God. I find an interesting parallel with that. And the prophecies of Jesus Christ himself. Luke 17, 26, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, 
And what was going on in the days of Noah? People were just eating and drinking and getting married and partying and, you know, whatever that party was. They were having a good time. And so the word of God is telling us that as it was during that time, violence was on the land, wickedness and evil was the order of the day. And God said, I'm going to destroy mankind from the face of the earth because of what was going on. They were not hearkening. They were not listening. They were carrying on their normal way of life until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So we know that Noah warned about this calamity that was coming upon the earth, but people couldn't care less. The church of God continues to warn people in these troubled times, and at a time when you think maybe a pandemic would bring some of those call out ones to their senses, you wonder what's going on. Because some people just don't, don't seem to care one bit. Because, you know, the normal human expectation. You work hard and you slave on the job and you get some money and you want to have fun. Nothing is really wrong with having fun, but there are some excesses that could lead to other things. It could become an idol in your life. It could become a situation where you have to make a choice between it serving God and mammon. So verse 28 says, yes, likewise also it was in the days of Lot. I find it amazing that I've heard quite a bit of sermons talking about the days of Noah and what was going on. But in Luke, it also likened it to the days of Lot. And what was going on in the days of Lot? We know that infamous city, Sodom and Gomorrah, and what was going on there, the sexual sins, homosexuality, and so on. But people, or politically correct world, you know, they do, they do not like to talk about that. For years, I can recall all the, the skeptics denounce whether, in fact, Sodom and Gomorrah existed because they couldn't find any trace of it. But archaeology in modern or modern, more later years have located Sodom and Gomorrah. I've held, I've, I've held a sulfur ball in my hand from the archaeological dig. The source of that sulfur is found nowhere else but in that region. And simply because they were looking at the wrong spot for Sodom and Gomorrah. But God lightened the days of Lot as well. They drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes. So it's not just the days of Noah. The escape for the refuge for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah was to leave this wicked and dreadful city. Leave. Because they had become corrupt. Why? Go back to the earlier question. Through their disobedience. Not listening to the word of God. In Genesis 6, verse 18, Yahweh said, I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You and your sons and your wives and your sons' wives with you. And verse 22 says, Noah did as the Lord had commanded. What happened because of Noah's obedience? His family was protected. What happened because Lot hearkened to the word of God? He escaped the wrath. 
that came tumbling down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Unfortunately, his wife had one foot in Sodom and one foot out, and she didn't make it. Another lesson for us, that we cannot serve God and mammon. We can't have one foot in the church and one foot outside. We have to decide who we're serving. God gave us a choice between evil and good, life and death. We have to make a choice. So the question remains, where are we? Are we in the ark? Are we outside of Sodom as we approach the New Testament Passover season? We are reminded of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that can cleanse any sin, no matter how difficult. But unfortunately, we have seen the ark floating away for some of us who have been called into the body. I don't believe now is the time to become preoccupied with the non-essentials when the, when the world is falling down. Do we realize how much our society has changed in the last two years? A lot has changed. A lot has changed. And more change is coming. But I'm one of those persons who, and I don't know if I'm going to sound callous, but sometimes I feel a little excited when I see these things happening. Yes, I feel a little excited. I know lives are being lost. I know families are torn apart by grief and, and pain and sorrow. I, I can imagine the pain that comes here, the burning sensation in the stomach when you lost, when you have lost someone. I've experienced it too. And, and when you hear of the bombings and when you see those clouds of vapor, of fire, when a bomb comes down on a city, and you cringe because someone's life has just been snuffed out. Or when you visit the hospital and you see a brother or a sister or a family or, or a wife or a husband or a child and you experience the last breath that is going, crippled by diseases, whether it's a cancer or, or hypertension or diabetes, when you see these things happening around you, I get a little comfort. I get a little excited because you know what? These things must come to pass. Our hope tells us, Jesus Christ tells us, about these times called the beginning of sorrows, the rumors of war, famines and nations against nation. This is a prime example of what's going on. But the mistake a lot of people made is to believe it's the end. The Bible said the end is not yet. There's more to come. But they are the beginning of sorrows. Some other translation terms it the, the beginning of birth pangs. Like when a woman is giving birth. The pain comes and it goes away. But then when it comes back, it intensifies. So I get a little excited to know these things are going to happen. We should not be troubled. We should not be fearful. If not, how how our redemption is going to come. He said, look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. So I want to encourage all of us to be strengthened by what's going on around us. Not to feel, as I said, fearful or dejected or sorrow. Yes, a little, we are, our human emotions play out and we'll feel a little sorrow here and there. It's natural. But we're a people of hope. There's a bigger picture awaiting us because we know the king is coming. 
the king is coming. And although the ark seemed to be floating away for some people, we have to realize that salvation is a personal thing. God is not returning to save CGI. Jesus Christ is coming to save individuals, not an organization. So we have a personal responsibility before God because his wrath is coming on those who live in disobedience, those who've rejected him, and they will reap the war, the rewards rather, for disobedience. Luke 17, 31 says in that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not run back. Remember Lot's wife, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whosoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you that in that night there will be two men in, in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where, where? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered. And this holy time that we are here assembled is a prime example of where God's people should be. Because you could be somewhere else. You could be in Disney, right? Epcot Center. Floating on those jolly rides and screaming like the rest of the world. No, but you're here. Because something draws you here. And that is how it should be. Because that time is coming, brethren, when probably we can't even meet in here. It's a reality. I think this COVID crisis has, has, has provided for us an opportunity to reflect on the times ahead. The early church of God met in homes. We may have to even go back there. Quite a few people in conversations I've had with them, they ask, why doesn't God stop this COVID crisis? Can he? I say, of course he can. The world doesn't think he can. He can stop it if he wants. But I don't think he will. That's just my personal view. I don't think he will. Because the God we worship allows, he is a God of purpose. He allows things to happen and situations to continue for a reason. It's all over the scriptures. So he can accomplish, so he can accomplish or be glorified some things that he wants. Isaiah 59, 1 tells us, Behold, the Lord is not shortened. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. So we have a society that loves to question God's authority and sovereignty, that likes to blame him for everything in the good times. In the good times. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, in the bad times. But when the good times come, they don't know him. So in the, when everything seems to be going awry, oh, God is, they blame God for, for everything. But when everything is nice and dandy, I don't know you, I don't need you. But the word of God says, your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with lawlessness. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. Because truth is relative. You determine your own truth. 
We don't want to hear from your God. Because your God allows little babies to die in Ukraine and they keep dying. And the whole city is like a, uh, some of those cities already under Russian control. Where's your God in all of this? The oppression that those people are experiencing now, the pain and the grief. Why, do you, why does your God allow that to happen? He said, they trust in empty words and they speak lies. They conceive evil and they bring forth iniquity. With all of what is going on, brethren, are you in that place of refuge? Are you in the ark where, where the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where Yahweh is your only hope, your only comfort, your refuge in times of distress and in times of grief and in times of the good and in the good times as well? Is he? Let's not doubt for a second that our God is in our midst. His word stands. He tells us, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. He cannot lie. He's with us. But when you are when in your situation, when you are, you use God as a convenience, or for your own convenience, you, you can't see the truth. And you can't see wrong, between wrong and right. You know, when you have a, I'm sure in some situations in the past or whenever, you have a rag that you use to, to you know, water spill on the floor. You have a little rag that you have. You keep it somewhere in a little spill, especially if you're working, and you use it and you put it away for convenience. This world treats our God like a dirty rag. It's harsh, but it's a reality. It's the reality. Isaiah 52, why was no one there when I arrived? Why did no one answer when I called? Is my hand too short to redeem you? Of course, this is meant for Israel, but we too can relate to this. Or do I lack the strength to deliver you? Behold, my rebuke dries up the sea. I turn the rivers into a desert. The fish rot for lack of water and die of thirst. And fifth, chapter 58, 9 says, then you will call. And the Lord will answer. You will cry out and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the malicious talk. Yes, we need, we need to take stock. And this is one very good time in a troubled world when we can pause to take stock. On a holy time like this is good. For brethren to come together to worship and to recognize Adonai as the sole authority, the sovereign one who is in charge. He's not, he's not inept and he's not handicapped. He's very much in charge. And he will come at that desired time. He's not dead. He's alive. And we need to shout it from the rooftop and everywhere we can that King Jesus is alive. And that pandemic or no pandemic or war or no war, he's still coming and nothing is going to stop his return. That's one proclamation in the word of God that is going to fulfill maybe in our lifetime. We don't know. It's not going to happen overnight. Jesus Christ will not return tomorrow, as some people feel they're going to be raptured any time. And the minute they're looking, oh, you know, I can't, it can be any time. Nonsense. There's a plan of action, and it's going to happen. You know, sometimes some, you, you get into some conversation with, 
with people, even within your own family. And, you know, I've learned through experience, sometimes we have to be a little more, and in my case, a little more tolerant. Because you talk to people, show them from the scriptures, not what some, something that is concocted from the pulpit and somebody bring their own traditional beliefs into and tell you this is so. And you, they can't show you in the Bible. What you sit and you talk and you show some people that you've met, as I say, in your own family, certain things that God expects of us. Some will tell you, oh, I worship any day. I worship God every day. I say, yes, I worship God every day. But he has his time, his appointed time. He has his appointed time for certain things. That, that's how orderly and detailed our God is. The Moedims, he gave them for certain things to be done. Not what you want to take as your own time and, say, and, and then have a nerve to crown it holy time. When God is the only one that deems what is holy from what is not holy. And sometimes you try to explain these things and people just, they just fan you off and say, no, I stick to what I know. But sometimes I believe, as in my case, I was a little too harsh. Because there are some people whose minds are not open and not receptive. And we realize and we teach in our word that God is the one who calls. God is the one who opens the minds. And when you see that mind open and the, and the, and the understanding that they have, you realize that God is a great God. You and I have gone through that experience and that their time will come as well. But I'm saying this to say, brethren, as the years go by, as I said, over the last two years, we've seen quite a bit a change in our society, in our own personal lives. Some things that you admit it, some things that you usually do, you're not doing it anymore. And you take on new challenges and new tasks. And it's all well and good as long as they're being done in the spirit of God and, and, and what he stands for. But we have a duty. We have a calling. We have a commission to get this bride ready for the bridegroom. We have to be in the ark in order to do that. We cannot allow socialization, society, and what's going on out there to rub off on us. That it's hard for someone who received that call and who have answered that call, and they look into the church and they can't find a difference between the church and any ordinary institution out there. We have to be that light shining in this world of darkness. This is what we are. This is who we are. We are Sabbath keepers. We are followers of the word of God. We are holy day keepers because the word of God says we should. We did not determine this holy time. God determines it. And so in your talk, brethren, we can't mince words. But sometimes we have to be tactful. Sometimes we have to be a little more tolerant. Because people look at our attitude sometimes, and if we come across maybe too harsh, we can turn them off. It's part of what we have to do to prepare the bride for the bridegroom, because he's coming. I told a friend recently, he said he doesn't believe anything from the word of God, that the Bible is a book of fiction that is thwarped history, that man wrote it and some of these men were corrupt. I say, okay. I say, okay. It doesn't matter what you believe. You know what? Whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. Jesus Christ is coming. And you can't stop it. Your disbelief can't stop it. 
whether you want to believe it or not, Jesus Christ is coming. And if he's calling you, you better prepare. Can't say you didn't hear from me. So we reached that level in our life experience because many of you here have been in the church many years. Lots of years. And you've gone through a lot. And you've realized that, you know, I've come through all these years. I can't afford to give up anything now. It wouldn't have worth the while. It's good to see the young ones in church. Because the church is aging. And you often wonder, I've been to quite a few congregations, I'll tell you this. And sorry to digress, but you hardly see any children. And it's sad. It's part of what is going on out there, brethren. It's part of what society rubbing off on us. Young people, God is not in their vocabulary. God is not on their minds. It's old, archaic people who have nothing to do worship God. That's their attitude. Some of them, most of them. But we have seen a society being transformed. Economies, econ um, countries' economies being transformed. We've seen health systems being challenged to the max. Never before in the history or modern history of humanity have we seen this. God allows it for a purpose. We may not know it right now, but he's allowing it for a purpose. There are more of this to come. As I said, it's the beginning of sorrows. It's the birth pangs upon us, brethren. We have taken a vow and we have taken a commitment before Yahweh to seek to endure to the end. Psalm 33, 18 tells us that Yahweh watches over those who obey him, those who trust in his constant love. He saves them from death. He keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He's our protector and our help. We are glad because of him. We trust in his holy name. May your constant love be with us, Lord, as we put our hope in you. They will not suffer. Uh, Psalm 37, 19. When times are bad, they will have enough in time of famine. Yes, he's not going to allow us to go on the street to beg bread. He provides for us. He's a God of providence. He's in charge, although the, ch the world paints him as a God, a reckless God who, who is handicapped, don't know what he's doing and not in charge of this universe, of, of his universe. The people of Noah were happy all the time. They didn't need God. There was no need for God in their estimation. So too were the people of Lot. They were doing the norm. But what they should have been doing were like the men of Nineveh. They were fasting and they were pain, praying. They were repenting and they were reforming because there was an approaching judgment. So brethren, as we, as we approach the most solemn period on our calendar, the Passover, what an opportune time for reflection of where we have been coming from in all those years and especially in the last two. In the last two, in the book of Hosea, it gives us an example of commitment and betrayal, two opposites. Much like what we see happening 
around because many people or some people are losing faith. Some people have become COVID fatigue. Not only that, if we're just in the pandemic and then you hear of a war, and you look up and every gas station you pass, you say, what is going on here? <laughs> uh, we just passed one out here and the price was just going like this. Mm -hmm. I said, maybe something is wrong with the electronic stuff, but I said, no, it's a war. And that is how the human reaction is to the abnormal. But more abnormal times are coming. So we look at how Hosea's marriage to the unfaithful Goma. Israel turned its back on God many times. Brethren, my fellow brethren, my fellow brothers and sisters here, we cannot afford to turn our backs on God at any time, whether too thick or thin. There's a picture in the word of God, a graphic picture of a God who loves us. But when we disobey and we sin against him, willfully we are touching on dangerous territory because we have tasted that heavenly gift. No turning back. Have to stay on the ark. So Hosea bought back his wife despite the adultery. Just like how Jesus paid the price for our sins. Hosea 1 verse 3, God commanded, go take yourself a wife of harlotry. Brethren, I have to lift my hat. I really don't wear a hat, but I have to lift my hat to Hosea. God is telling you, go and marry a prostitute. And not only that, <laughs> there will be children involved. Wow. Now we know the story. He did. He marries a prostitute. But out of that, and again it goes back to God's purpose, that he does things for a purpose. To achieve something. For his glory, or for the common good, or for an example to us. And when we look at these parallels, with the situation with Hosea's story, he marries a prostitute, just like how God is betrothed to Israel. He's a faithful husband. God is faithful to us, faithful to the us right to the end. Hosea's love is one-sided. He loves his wife, despite of what she was doing to him. God's love is the same. We sin against him, but he still loves us. Goma pursues other men. We have a tendency in our society, just like how Israel pursued other gods, we like to pursue the other gods. We like to dip our nose in any religion except Christianity. In the whole country, North America, we have the same way in Canada. Love to dip our nose into other religion as long as it's not Christianity. Oh, it's enlightenment and... Goma is indifferent to Hosea's feeling. No matter how what he did, she just have a hardened heart against him and his feelings. And Israel was the same thing, indifferent to God's feelings. Hosea has a son whose name was Lo Ami, means not my people. And interestingly, verse 9, God declares that Israel was not his people because he became so turned off from what they were doing. But Hosea redeems and restores the adulterous Goma. Just like how God will redeem and restore unfaithful Israel and us, and us. The problem with our world today is that we are not looking to God for solutions. 
that is the number one issue facing our world today. God is no longer relevant because we have our own solutions. We can declare peace, we can make peace, and we have the means to do it, so we're going to pursue it. Brethren, only those in the ark practice and know that God is the solution to humanity's problem. If you take a megaphone and you start walking here in Urbandale and broadcasting to everybody, or if you go to, let's go to Orlando and busy place and start doing that, people probably would laugh you to scorn. Some people. They call you mad. They call you mad. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. And, and that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that you have forgotten the law of thy God, I will forget your children. And I wonder often about this one. You have forgotten my law, I have also forgotten your children. Hmm. Hmm. And verse 7 as they were increased, so they sinned against me. I was just reading some time ago where the aspirations among some researchers and medical personnel is to have us live 120 years. A lot of research going on to prolong life. I said to myself, for what? To sin more against God. That's the answer. Because when you can do that, you don't need God anymore. Although, you know, they don't, still don't need God now. <laughs> when they can achieve that, they make it work. Makes it worse. They don't need God anymore. Plain God. But Yahweh said, therefore, will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people and they set their heart on their lawlessness. On their lawlessness and there shall be like people like priests and I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings for they shall eat and not have enough they shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed of the Lord we've been preaching this gospel of the kingdom of God for years some have answered some have not we have taken the blood off our shoulders. We continue to preach. Whatever forum is available, whether it's social media, it's our here, it's our through the literature, we've been doing that and we have to. We have to. We are in the ark. And there are more people to rescue through the hearing of this word. In this society, who is the protector? We, he's our protector. We have to do what he says. As the Passover approaches, brethren, let's remember there's a voice crying out there in this vast wilderness. Trust in me. Listen to me. Put not your faith in the systems and governments of this world. All of them, Satan the devil has claimed them. Satan said, they are my kingdom. Not my words. He told Jesus, bow down, I give you all of these kingdoms. So who they belong to? Put not your faith in the systems and governments of this world. All of them have been claimed by Satan the devil. They are bound to fail. They are bound to fail. They have failed already and they continue to fail. God does not take pleasure in people who put their trust in the systems of men and disobey, end up disobeying him. King Hezekiah was the king of Judah. 
before the fall of Judah, and he reigned in very turbulent times in Judah, much like what's going on in our society today. He was a very humble man of God. You know, he encourages people to turn to God as a leader. Turn to Yahweh. He has the solutions. But he fell in a situation where, and I'll read it, in 2 Kings 20, verse 2. Because he was visited by a prophet sent directly from God to warn what is going to happen to him. The very one who created him, Yahweh. But I have to lift my heart again to Hezekiah. Because he was brave. He was brave. He didn't accept the warning. He challenged the warning. Brethren, what grounds would we have to challenge what God says or dictate and say, this is an edict. You're going to die. Verse 2 tells us, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord. And this is what he says, remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully, with wholehearted devotion, and have done what is good in your sight. And he could say that because he knew he, knew he did it. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And here it comes, brethren. And God heard his prayers and added 15 years more to his life. That was how a leader, a leader, loved God, followed him, total devotion. And not only that, his faith and his relationship with God allowed him to make such a bold challenge. I probably would be shy and say, Lord, I'm afraid God struck me down. I'm not going to challenge what God says. But he had such a strong relationship. He did it. And God listened. Well, look at the opposing side, his son Manasseh. He was not like him. He was one of the wickedest kings in Israel, in Judah. And all the good work his father did, he reversed. He earned the name, the king who made Judah to sin. But before the fall of Judah, Judah, King Hezekiah got rid of the idol worship and the people participated, struck down all of those idols, Baal worship, they cleansed the temple, led the people to a whole spiritual revival, renovated and rebuilt the infrastructure of Judah and Jerusalem. But what did Manasseh do with all of that? He got rid of it. Second Chronicles 33, Manasseh was 12 years old, 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and five, 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord has cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up altars of Balaam, and made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven, the stars in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times. He used enchantments. He used witchcraft. And he dealt with a familiar spirit. And with wizards he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. This is what our world is doing today. They are provoking Yahweh to anger by their idolatry. They put everything else above him. 
everything else above him. And when you put everything else above God, you commit idol idolatry. He set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh did all of this, brethren. What a stark example. What a good example. He said, and you know what? God is merciful. His mercies endureth forever. That's the message we want to get people to everyone. No matter how your sins are, God is merciful. If we only turn to him. Verse 12. And when he was in his affliction, Manasseh, he besought Yahweh and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him and he was entreated of him. And he heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then the Manasseh, then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was Wow, our leaders today, I tell you, if they would only follow this example, we would see a different world this morning. Not the one we wake up with, with bodies being maimed and soldiers lying in the streets. And this is not only happening in the Ukraine, there are other battles being fought around the world. Some of them we don't even hear of, with a civil war or any kind of war. So there's a price to pay for disobedience, even in this life and the life to come. We, as God's people, shouldn't falter in our beliefs that God can protect us, and if it gets worse, gets worse, when other things are striking the earth, and they're going to happen. Seven seas of revelation are coming upon us. Destruction, calamity, pain, and grief. But God promised that he's going to be with us. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. He promises us a great deal, and he's going to be fulfilling all of what he has said. He has a manifesto that is true with every word written in it. Not a broken manifesto. He doesn't need to call Congress to come together to get approval to implement anything. That's how mighty and awesome is our God. We have to love him unconditionally, not only through our lips. Not only through our lips, but through how we live our lives and how we recognize him as, and surrender to him as the Lord and Savior. And so we come, Father, brethren, knowing that John 4.23 tells us the hour comes and now is. When true worshipers, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, back to my earlier question, are we in the ark? I say, yes, that's why we're here. We're in the ark. We can fall overboard. 
but we are in the ark. We are on this journey that we started. And it's my fervent desire for all of us here, all of us in the body of Christ to continue on that journey because we have a great supper coming that we've been invited to, the great marriage supper of the Lamb. And we want to see as many as those whom he has been calling and called to be there. But as I indicated at the beginning of this year in a sermon, we just have to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So brethren, stay on the ark, and God be with you.